Welcome, everybody. We'll go ahead and start. Okay, we'll start with Refuge in Bodhicitta. Sangge chudon sogi chunam bai jan chu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yen gi pe sonam gi rola penche sangge drupa show sangge chudon sogi chunam bai jan chu padu dani kapsu chi Dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki Prola penche sangge drupa show Sangge churam sogi chunam ba Jan chu badu dane kapsu chi Dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki Prola penche sangge drupa show Letting the meaning connect. Today, we're going to look at the Guru Puja, Lama Chopa, and the first point of confusion will be what is the difference between Guru Puja and Lama Chopa? There is no difference, it is the same thing. Uh, Guru Puja is Sanskrit, Lama Chopa is Tibetan. Okay, so that's the first confusion out of the way that usually happens. Um, together with that is what happens when you're at Guru Puja and there are add-ons. Because um, as Tibetan Buddhist centers, we do Guru Puja twice a month. And twice a month is a time when we can all gather as a community. And since we're there, we kind of maximize the fact that we're all there and we add in things like the eight verses of thought transformation or the stories of the Buddha's previous lives or this extra tantra prayer or that extra tantra prayer. And there's a lot of weave-ins that get plugged into the Lama Chopa practice, which are wonderful and deep, but also optional. When you hear the word sog, that is a component that gets brought into Lama Chopa Guru Puja on those sog days, the 10th and 25th of the Tibetan calendar. But uh, they aren't necessary components of the Guru Puja Lama Chopa practice itself. The Lama Chopa Guru Puja practice itself can be done just on its own. And a lot of people do it as their daily practice. And the Lama Chupa is said to be one of Lama Zopa Rinpoche's heart practices, his go-to practice. And it's incredibly beautiful, it's incredibly rich, and there's many, many, many layers. So that's something that might be obvious even after going to it just once, that there are many layers and there's a lot of depth. And that very thing might not be the thing that makes you excited and engaged. It might make the very thing that makes you sort of put off and kind of say, wow, that's really overwhelming. That's so much. All the smells, all the bells, all the movement, all the things can make you wonder, is this a practice that's too advanced for me? Or is this something that I should be engaged with at my level? And the answer is, everybody's welcome. There's a way to engage with this practice even as a complete beginner. And also we have to start somewhere. So don't feel intimidated by the fact that there are so many layers. There's parts of it that you can touch with almost immediately upon reading the English. So what we're gonna do today and tomorrow is not a commentary on Lama Chippa Guru Puja. What it is is an introduction to how to engage with the practice at the level of a beginner or an intermediate practitioner or even advanced practitioner who is not familiar with highest yoga tantra. So for you that are highest yoga tantra practitioners and want a commentary on Lama Chippa Guru Puja, I would really recommend requesting someone like Jado Rinpoche or reading the book by His Holiness, The Union of Bliss and Emptiness. So for those of you that are senior students and practice highest yoga tantra, this is something really auspicious to request from your teachers. There's also many, many good resources on the Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive site of Lama Zopa explaining how to chant various parts, different ways to visualize different parts. 
but I would say leave that until you have highest yoga tantra. Um, in the beginning, I think let's just find what's familiar. So I'm going to just show you the contents page and already you're going to see there's a lot of familiar elements. Okay. So it says at the very beginning, the practice requirement, although this practice may be performed by anyone, a highest yoga tantra initiation is required to receive or receive a commentary on it. So this is an important thing to keep in mind. It may be performed by anyone, but in order to figure out all the layers and to read more deeply about it, wait until you have highest yoga tantra. Okay, the contents page. So helpfully it starts with guides to pronouncing Sanskrit. That's very helpful. But the Lama Chopa itself, it starts with preliminary practice, the actual practice, and then generating the merit field. And in generating the merit field, you're gonna see elements that are already familiar from when we were looking at Medicine Buddha and when we were looking at Tara, which is a visualization. And then once you have a visualization, you invoke. You invoke the wisdom beings to the commitment beings. So remember that the wisdom beings are all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in the aspect of whatever deity practice you're doing. So if we're visualizing Medicine Buddha, then all of the wisdom beings are in the aspect of Medicine Buddha and are invited to the space where we visualized. In this case, it's a whole merit field. And then we invite all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to enter into that shape and form. So these are similar elements. They're just slightly more elaborate than what we've looked at before. Instead of one deity, we're thinking about a whole field of deities. Then we move on to the seven limbs. And it's the same seven limbs as we talked about a few weeks ago. It's just longer and more elaborate. And then requests and mantra recitation. And then here we get into the add-ons. So these are optional but lovely. You can insert at this point a, a mantra recitation time, some nice lojong prayers, stuff like that. And then you get into the sog part. And the Lama Chukpa sog part kind of requires its own conversation. So we'll do sog tomorrow, but we'll do up until sog today. So there should be a few points there that are starting to ring some bells, just gently, gently. And, um, and we'll have time to talk about it too. So I thought I'd just um, start by showing you the various accoutrements. Okay, so what do you need for Lama Chupa Guru Puja? Everyone needs the text. <laughs> okay, that seems obvious, but everybody needs the text. And we put the text on a brocade. We put the text on a brocade or a nice tablecloth of some kind in order to show respect for the material within the text. Also good for everyone to have is a mala, and it's good to start getting into the tradition of putting your malas into a bag so that you have your ritual mala for ritual purposes only. And then you might have a different mala that's like you're walking around mala that you use in your everyday life, just, you know, walking the dog or at staff meetings or whatever. So that's something, these two are the things that everybody needs. Now, the other bits are not bits that everybody needs. This the extra component up on the upper right hand side, these are things that need to be on the Vajra master's desk. The umze or the chant leader. And other highest yoga tantra practitioners may also have these implements with them at puja as well, but at least one person, the Vajra master, needs to have them. So the way the ritual implements go, according to Gyume Tantra College, is to have on the upper right hand side, on their own brocade, an inner offering, a dorje or Vajra, a bell, and a damaru. Optional is a mandala set. So it goes from left to right. Here's the inner offering, the dorje or vajra, the bell, and the damaru. 
And those implements are covered in this image intentionally, even though you probably have seen them out of their covering. Because again, like the mala, it's good to start getting into the habit of covering ritual objects. So a um, couple of things to think about. The extra brocade and the coverings of implements this is something that helps us preserve the sense of secrecy and sacredness of the tantric path. So of course, we've seen tantric images and we've seen tantric implements like a Vajra and Bell. It's not like they're really secret, but by covering our own personal set, we're creating a intensified energy and connection with our own implements. And the, the bond and the connection between your own practice and your outer displays of practice can become strengthened and more sacred. So there is um, practical things to think about in terms of Dharma centers where you might have like a house set, which are kind of dorjes and bells that are available for anyone with a tantric empowerment to use in the gompa if they didn't bring their own. But it's nice to start thinking about if you do have a tantric empowerment, that you keep a set private, covered, and sacred. Similarly with the mala, we all know what a mala looks like, prayer beads. We know what prayer beads look like. We don't have to be secret about them putting them in a bag. The reason why we are secret about them putting them in a bag is creating more of this sense of sacredness and building up the intensity of the energy that we use these implements for. So a mala, or prayer beads in and of themselves, they're just a counting object, right? They're not a sacred object in and of themselves, but they become a sacred object based on what we do with them. So at the sutra level, you already become familiar with things like not bringing them to the toilet with you, you know, about, or at least putting them in your purse or a pocket, you know, about not, um, you know, going into dirty places with your malas on. Um, not wearing them like jewelry, you know, kind of ornamentation, that these are actually aids for your spiritual path. You're already starting to get into that headspace at the sutra level. But then in the tantra level, you're elevating that even more. Does it make sense? And the adding of the brocade, it's not because the text needs your brocade, it doesn't care. But by adding something special in your mind, you're adding sacredness which means you engage more deeply and more fully with the things that you're adding extra things to. So you'll see on the llama's desk, it's like a brocade explosion on the llama's desk, isn't it? There's like the main brocade and then there's another brocade and then there's a little brocade for all the tantra implements and then another brocade for their, their text and then sometimes another one that covers everything up. It's like, it's a tantra extravaganza and it's like brocades o rama. And the Lama does not care, okay? It's again about creating this sense of sacredness and specialness and elevating things related to Tantra. Because we're realizing that we need foundational vehicle practices, we need general perfection vehicle practices, and then we're doing Vajra vehicle practices. And they're all layered one on top of the other. Much depends on what came before, but there is a hierarchy just as there are with vows. You know, the lay people vows and the monastic vows, these pratamoksha vows of individual liberation, they're to help us get out of samsara and they're related mainly to actions of body and speech. Then you get your bodhisattva vows and they're related to actions of body, speech and mind. And then you get into the tantric vows and they're about overcoming ordinary appearance and grasping elevated work with the mind plus body and speech. So you're getting more and more subtle, you're getting more and more nuanced, and you're getting more mature as a practitioner as you move from sutra to perfection vehicle to tantra or however you want to describe the vehicles. This layering is a hierarchy, even if it is essential to practice those basic ones, and that you can't like escape the basic ones. You have to absolutely have things like renunciation, etc. So all of this kind of like ritual accoutrement is very much about a mind training internally. So don't feel like you need to buy lots of stuff. That, it's not about buying stuff. How do you do this if you don't have much money? Is that you find something that is just used 
for the tantric purpose and you make sure it's very clean. This is the way that we're taught as monastics because we're not supposed to have lots of fancy expensive stuff and yet we still need to create these same mind training habits of elevating things. So for example, like with the offering bowls and stuff, I don't know if you can see them. Right, see, oh, there, <laughs> right? It's, they're not expensive, they're just special. Okay, so they're, you know, it's just like some Ikea bowls and some random dollar store bowls. And, you know, it's just stuff to put your offerings in, but they're kept separate and clean and specific for ritual. They're not the ones I use for my lunch. Do you know what I mean? So they don't have to be expensive. They just need to have a sense of specialness and particularly clean and kept separately. Any, any thoughts about that kind of just accoutrement stuff so far? Or, yeah, go ahead. As always, from Young Youngton. Um, can you talk a little bit about like the computer and the cell phone, which have all of my stuff on it? And, and like, it's, it's impossible to always put it on a okay, you know, but like, what's the attitude and what's the good practice with like the electronics? Yeah, it, it's an evolving thing. And I, I think that we all have to sit with our own resonance with it but for example trying not to have the computer on the bed where your feet go you know trying not to have the tablet come into the bathroom with you or put on a dirty table you know you're treating these things as they have dharma in them right. so let's respect the fact that they have dharma in them i don't have to do all necessarily these extra things of brocades on brocades of brocades but I definitely need to think of them as dharma and not put them on the floor or put them where shoes are or put them in dirty places. Yeah, stuff like that. So, so it's just about this mental training of when you elevate things in a physical way, it very much helps you elevate things in a mental way. And we are connected body and mind. And whenever you can bring in a physical element to remind you of a mental practice, it's going to add more depth and more connection. So it's not like, you know, Zeus is not going to send down lightning bolts if you put your computer on the floor. <laughs> you know, you're not going to be sent to the Vajra Hells for all of eternity because you forgot to take your mala off before you went to the bathroom. It's all about your own mental training and that philosophy that I say so much about you become receptive to what you respect. You become receptive to what you respect. So thoughts of respect, words of respect, gestures of respect make you open to the path and all that supports your path. If you let, leave it as too ordinary, it stays in the realm of ordinary and it's easy to gloss the Dharma as something like personal development work and self-help advice. And then it will be that and stay as that. And for a lot of people, that's all the Dharma is, is just nice self-help, good psychology, kind of good stuff to get through the day, helps me be a nice person, which is great, but it could be more than that if you opened yourself to the fact of its depth. So a lot of these behaviors and postures and words are to get us into receptivity with the incredible profundity of this path and not to leave it as this superficial thing. Yeah, Diane, go ahead. Uh, I was just thinking about um, those things you were saying, you know, in terms of traveling. So if you're trying to travel with one suitcase, you know, you've got your underwear in there. <laughs> Plus, <laughs> so maybe just have a nice brocade to wrap your implements in or your pictures or whatever, and then it can still be okay to have it in the same, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, it's, it's about using common sense without getting into a complacency, you know, and so you know, I travel all the time. So my suitcase has one of those zipper compartments that's separate. And I just I very consciously Dharma things in that section, you know, clothing miscellaneous in the other section, and anything particularly holy I wrap. Yeah, wrap in a kata, but even just wrap in a clean cloth, you know. So it doesn't have to be anything to do with expensiveness. It's much more about intentional positioning of things. Yeah. Um, 
I, I remember when I was a, a teenager and I was first really interested in Buddhism and I had all these books from His Holiness, I used to put them all together on the lowest shelf of the bookshelf because it was closest to me when I was sitting on the floor doing my meditation because I didn't know you were supposed to put the Dharma books higher. I didn't know, but I kept them clean and I dusted them all the time and I kept them all together and they were like my precious, precious books on the floor. And, you know, then later I found out you're supposed to put your Dharma books higher and I had all of this guilt and worry until I realized the whole point is to elevate in a mental sense with respect. And so the behavior was not in alignment with tradition, but the mentality was, you know, so it's much more about the mentality, even though, of course, now I put all my Dharma books higher. But, you know, you don't, so, so don't get... Um, tight or fundamentalist, but also don't get complacent and lazy. And each of us as an individual knows what both forms look like <laughs> in ourselves. Yeah. And so just kind of, okay, <laughs> back to the best version. So that's what's on the desk when you're practicing Guru Puja, Lama Chopa. When you're practicing this practice, the chanting leader is going to do some things in Tibetan and some things in English. The things that are done in Tibetan are often because the tune that goes with them was inspired by or given by Dakinis, enlightened beings, in um, meditation to practitioners. So by trying our best to sing in those tunes and kind of riding the coattails or getting into the slipstream of Tibetan practitioners who developed before us, we can kind of elevate our practice into something less conceptual, it's still conceptual, but less kind of coarse, for lack of a better word, and it can inspire and uplift the mind. So that's one reason for chanting, one reason for Tibetan, one reason for those tunes. The other is, in a group practice, some of the Tibetan verses are done in Tibetan in order to help the new people not develop wrong views by giving them too much time to read the English and be like, what does that mean? So some of it's a little bit of a nothing to see here, nothing to see here, moving along, moving along. Right? And if you were to read the English, and of course, many people do read the English verses while the Tibetan chanting is happening. It's very common to be a bit bewildered by some of the verses in Guru Puja. Some of the verses are very confusing. So just know that and say that's going on the list of things to check when I have highest yoga tantra. What can I connect with? Oh, a huge amount. But there are a couple of verses that are a little bit of a head scratcher. I'm not going to push aside the fact that I have a reaction or pretend that I don't have a reaction. I'm just going to put that on a shelf until I have the supports and the permissions to have those conversations. So sometimes the, the verses are done in Tibetan just so there's not as much time to look at those more confusing elements that new people are going to be tangled by. So then there's going to be parts that are done in English, at least if you have um, an English speaking person as your chanting leader. And the portions done in English are usually the Lam Rim prayer. There might be a few other places where English happens, but the Lam Rim prayer is one of the best places to shift gears because we've studied the Lam Rim at least a little bit. And so the words of those verses in our mother tongue is going to have a heart resonance in a different way. So you don't have to do them in English, but it's nice to kind of do some portions in English that are very accessible and universally understood by all of the people in the group. Some people like chanting, like music, don't care what it means. They're just in the flow or in the vibe. Some people, it's very off-putting to not know what it is they're singing or chanting. So we're trying to kind of have a broad appeal when we do these group practices and make sure there's something for everyone. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I'll show you the, um, the main altar layout and uh, the main two visualizations in a second. But before I do that, are there things that you've wondered about, about the chanting procedure or about um, just being in a group doing that practice that you wanna make sure that we cover? Yeah, go ahead, Christine. I've read that the tunes are very specific and um, I, I, I am not specific. So, you know, how do you, can you just, 
I, as soon as I feel like, oh, I'm really messing up, I should just be quiet. Like the person next to me is probably not helping them. That's for sure. You know, so how do you like try to learn the tunes? But I mean, I even listened online once till I was open. I mean, they're really complicated and they're, yeah. There's sounds and notes that like, I don't know how to make my mouth do that. So what's like the rest attitude and how do you, how do you learn them if you can't say them? Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. It's a really, it's a really good question. Um, and I'll, I'll just tell you my own approach and other teachers might have other approaches. I think that, um, Lama Zopa Rinpoche's chakras are pervaded by Dakinis and he can make magical notes that not many people can make. So there's that, okay. But there's also people that have like just a general musical affinity. You know, you did choir in class as a kid, you sort of can carry a tune, okay. So what you try and do, um, and that's the category I fall into. I don't have an amazing voice. I don't have a terrible voice. I have just kind of a workable kind of a voice of a regular American person who did a lot of music classes as a child. Yeah, just kind of a middle of the road kind of a person. And my approach is, when Lama Zopa Rinpoche is leading a puja, I never am louder than him, <laughs> okay? I am never louder than him. And that's the good rule, is never be louder than the chant leader. If you can't hear the chant leader, you're too loud. It seems obvious, but sometimes people who aren't as used to group chanting kind of get on a roll with their own kind of randomness and go off on a whole tangent. And it is very distracting for the people around them. So start quiet and start just kind of tuning into the note as best as you can. And when I'm with Lama Zopa Rinpoche, I try so hard to match and marry up my tone to his while knowing that I can't. And so it's just that, that really gentle effort, let go, effort, let go, almost the same approach as you have during normal meditation with your own distractions. You don't push them or deny them or chase them, but you're also not indulging in them. You're just having that kind of like not too tight, not too loose attitude with any kind of Buddhist practice you're doing. So, you know, just gently merge with the people around you, gently merge with the chanting leader. And if it's very, very new, just kind of even humming under your breath to try and stay pace. But you'll notice when Tibetans are all together in puja, they don't necessarily match up like perfect little choir students, but they totally match up the pace. So if your tone is not perfect, that's not the end of the world, but try and stay the same speed as the group. The same speed is more important than the same pitch. So if you can stay the same speed, what happens is you get that beautiful group energy and that group momentum and that kind of collective connecting hive mind magic that can happen in pujas where you're still your own consciousness going through your own process, but you're also held by the group experience and maybe able to go even deeper than usual because of your fellow practitioners. So try and stay the same speed, do your best with the pitch. And that's why um, the tradition is for any change of tune, you give the chanting leader the first at least three syllables to just the chanting leader. People don't just jump right in, right? You stop and listen when there's an obvious shift in the chapter and you give them that so you can hear the pitch and you can hear the speed. And then everyone joins in usually with the third or fourth syllable. But if you're not sure when to join in, give the chanting leader the whole first line of the verse, if you're not sure, and then join in on the second line of the verse. And it's usually quite obvious when these transitions are because the chanting leader will slow down at the end of one section in a kind of definitive punctuated way. And the older students will know that and also stop and there'll be that shift. So it's just, you know, the first few times you're just listening really well and just trying without tension. And whenever you get lost, just go back to whispering under your breath. Try to have some sort of words coming out of your mouth so that you can have that positive speech karma created and so that you can have the movement of the winds happening. But you don't have to be perfect at all. Just kind of whisper along best you can without getting tight. Yeah, um, Colleen? 
I think you've uh, pretty much answered my question, but uh, further on to it, uh, you were saying that you wait for the umze to do the first two or three syllables of, is it just the first round or all three rounds if you're doing your... It's, um, it's, well, it depends on what section we're talking about, but um, whenever there's an obvious transition from one tune to another, in obvious transitions, give them the first three syllables. Um, when you're talking rounds, I'm assuming you're talking about the offering the tsog portion, which you do three times. In that case, um, the first round is long. And so give them the first three syllables for at least the first verse. But some, some uh, traditions say for every verse of the long version. And then when you get to the quick rounds, the first three or four syllables of the first verse, and then everybody just jump right in for the rest of it and you rock it along. Yeah. So basically, when in doubt, follow the chanting leader. And if you're not sure, follow the group. The, the tricky thing is, is that there are several correct ways. And they're all correct ways. It's not like there's a wrong way, right way issue. There's like several correct ways. And you will know one correct way. And then the chanting leader might do a different correct way and it aggravates you. And you think, well, I know the correct way to do it. I'm ringing my bell here. And it's totally the wrong time because the chanting leader sets the tone. And what's funny is that even if the chanting leader is wrong, they're right because the most important thing is to be together, to be together. So follow the chanting leader, even if they are ringing their bell at the wrong time. If you're sitting next to them, you, you, know, you can poke them and be like, oi, but you know, otherwise just go with the flow. So this is one of the things about pujas is that um, occasionally there's like just a fully wrong way, but if someone's the chanting leader, they probably know a correct version. So go in sync with them, even if it's not the version that you're used to with Pooja's togetherness, togetherness, togetherness. So Guru Pooja itself can take anywhere from an hour and a half to four hours, <laughs> depending on your chanting leader. Um, in the nunnery at Chenrezig Institute, where I did my training, we did Lama Chopa every single morning without SOG, just Lama Chopa as its own practice. And you can get it into, you know, 45 minutes if you're really like zipping along with the chanting, but that's because it's really familiar. So it's, in terms of speed, I think that it's a really good thing to think about how is a pace that's gonna keep people sharp and focused without tight and panicky and slow enough that they can connect and visualize without slipping into fatigue, dullness, vaguing out. So if you're the person leading the puja, try and hit that balance where you're ticking along quick enough to keep everybody sharp, <laughs> but you're not dragging and making people exhausted and weary. And that is gonna be a personal choice and it's gonna vary hugely. And if you ever go to one of these big retreats with Lama Zopa Rinpoche, you might spend the whole day doing Lama Chopa. <laughs> yeah, you'll do a couple hours here, have a break for breakfast, a couple hours here, go have lunch, a couple hours, right? It could take the whole day. And it's not about like finishing it in those contexts. It's about deepening your connection with it in those contexts. So it's a very popular text. It's a very significant text. And it's a text that can carry you your whole practice sutra level. It can carry you at perfection level. It can carry you at Vajra vehicle level and then all sorts of ways of integrating it in terms of Pius Dukkha Tantra. So it's worthwhile making friends with it, um, but it is a lot <laughs> in the beginning. What we're it's, it's not so much in the Guru Puja, but in other practices that begin with uh, refuge in bodhicitta verses um, that the chant leader doesn't do, but the, the doesn't necessarily do, but the, the Lama does. Um, mm. Are you supposed to not, the very first part, like the Sangye Chodong, are you supposed to not join in with that? Or when do you join in with that? Um, at least the first round. The Sangye, everybody joins in it. Yeah. 
So the sangue is you understanding the tune and the pace in that context. And uh, in the FPMT, often we let this, the chanting leader or the llama have the first two syllables all three rounds, but at least the first round, at least the first round. Um, and, you know, the thing is, is that we can have all sorts of weirdness with our chanting, like pride of, um, I know the pace, I know the tune, and people will just jump in as soon as it starts and almost like take it from the llama. <laughs> and the llama might even be doing a slightly different tune. And so it's, it's again and again, stepping back from yourself and remembering that none of this is a performance. And if anyone is watching you as an individual, it's probably because you're too loud. <laughs> So chill out, chill out. Yeah, and, and really don't make it a performance. Really talk, think in terms of blending and merging with the guru, blending and merging with the group and feeling connected and uplifted by that group experience. And we as Westerners are just not as used to that as much as people that grew up in Asian countries, you know, to make a very broad generalization. We're not very good at thinking I don't need to stick out. But in fact, if you stick out, you're kind of creating dissonance and jangliness. Yeah, so yeah, so it's a very, it's a very good point about even refuge in Bodhicitta. And what'll happen is that, you know, because of the pandemic, we haven't been together as a group in person. So we, we might be actually forgetting some of those etiquette things that we used to know. So if you're um, the SPC or the director or a volunteer coordinator or somebody in a position of gathering the troops, <laughs> just gently remind them without being like Dharma police. Yeah, just gentle, uplifting reminders. Okay, so everybody text everybody Mala. Optional, a bag or a plate for the saw later when it gets distributed. On the Vajra Master's desk, inner offering, door J Bell, Damaru. Optional is a mandala set. Okay, so here's the altar that I have right now, which is a good example of a small Dharma Center altar, or if you're hosting Lama Chopa at your own house. So obviously I'm just in my apartment with things that I have, and this is as good as it gets. My llama pictures are not all framed. You know, my uh, bowls are of varying degrees of fancy, but it's still pretty, right? It still makes your mind happy and it has the basic things. So you need to have representations of the gurus, holy body, holy speech, holy mind. So a Buddha picture somewhere, a text somewhere, a stupa somewhere, even if it's just a picture, even if it's just a picture on your tablet, propped, have representations of gurus, holy body, holy speech, and holy mind. And then the offering bowls for Lama Chupa are slightly different than the norm. You have four waters, and then flowers, incense, light, perfume, and food. And then you have sog, and the sog is going to be food that is transformed. So the food that is transformed needs to be very delicious. So some of it's going to be delicious and not particularly healthy, but triggers attachment. Some of it's going to be delicious, triggers attachment, and is healthy. But what you want to make sure is that it's definitely stuff that makes you want it. Because part of this whole process of Lama Chopa is about transforming our relationship to desire objects and using attachment differently, not being, um, not being so, I guess, captivated by sense objects, but bringing those same things that tempt us into the field of our offerings. So there's a lot of things around Tantra philosophy that go into this that I won't go into now but it is intentional that these are very tempting foods. We could have a vegan casserole there, but unless it's an extremely exciting, delicious vegan casserole, it's not necessarily the best kind of offering. It needs to be particularly tempting things. And then you have what's called mandana and bala, which are in um, the two little jars um, by the cherries, and those are tantric substances. And then you can add flowers and extra candles and things like that. So basically arrange everything as beautifully as you can. 
And so you can tell that I don't really have a fancy situation happening. It looks like the tunka behind me is very fancy, but it's actually just silk screened. It's not even a painted one. And all the things there, you know, they're nice, but they're not like super expensive. You're just trying to arrange them in a way that makes your mind happy. And if they make your mind happy, they're a good offering. So there are four waters, two more than usual, due to this practice's relationship to Haruka. So whether you understand about Haruka or not, if you're in charge of setting up the offerings, make sure you have four waters, not two. And the food that becomes sog should be on plates and bowls that are used only for ritual offering purposes, or at least very clean and incensed before each use. The Bala and Madonna um, are offered only to people with highest yoga tantra during the distribution of song section. So that's verses 70 through 75, that song of the spring queen. You'll see helpers coming around with two small bowls. Unless you have highest yoga tantra, ignore that. When there is a Lama physically present, the Tsog, the Bala and Madonna are offered to them first, verses 68 to 69, and a special Lama bowl of Tsog is prepared for them with a portion of all of the best foods. So I've sort of made a Lama bowl with um, this one that has like Tim Tams and apple chips and delicious chocolate all in one bowl. If the Lama was present, that's what we would offer to them. And then all of the other tsog would get distributed to the rest of the assembly during that section. Okay, so we'll come back to um, tsog later, but just in terms of the altar, are there things that you want to ask about or are curious about? Altar questions. Straightforward enough? Yeah. yeah, Colleen, go ahead. I'm just wondering, you know, I hear different teachers talk about when you take your altar down, your daily mm -hmm. altar down, you take it down every night or do you take it down the next morning? Or with Guru Puja, is it a different time schedule? With Guru Puja, um, the food offerings get distributed, you know, later in the practice and everyone goes home and eats them mindfully. <laughs> the water bowls, um, don't leave them more than 24 hours is a good rule. Don't leave water bowls more than 24 hours. If after the puja you want to empty them right away, that's totally fine. Like if that's when there's helpers and there's momentum and there's time. But if it all feels a bit too much, you can do it the next morning. That's okay for Guru Puja. Um, with any of our offerings on our altars, it's like don't bring too much pressure, guilt, shame, performance, weirdness to it, but also be quite conscious and make sure that you do keep your altar clean, empty your water bowls, you know, wipe them nicely, turn them upside down, incense them before you use them again, that kind of stuff. It is important for your mind, but if you have a rough day or a busy day and it doesn't happen, it's not the end of the world, you know, so that kind of a balance. If you have food offerings on your altar, and it's not sog, um, food offerings on your altar that you're taking down. Uh, there is a little offering mantra that you can say before you take the food off of the altar. And um, it's basically just, uh, I'm not just taking this because I want it now. I have now offered it, it's been offered, and now I'm taking it. <laughs> so there is a mantra you can say that kind of helps avoid negativity and pollution of, of taking delicious offerings off. Yeah, did that answer your question? That's great. Yeah, and uh, somebody else had their hand raised. Oh, Christine, yeah, go ahead. But, you know, I have food in my altar and I never know when I should take it down. I mean, if it's fruit, you know, I, I, I watch it to make sure it's not getting kind of rotten, you know, but there's like chocolates and other things and I never know how long to leave, to leave them. Well, if you have offered it during your practice, then it's done, take it off. Just every day? Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's a lot of chocolate. <laughs> well, so, you know, I mean, this is the thing is if it's one of these things where it's like your Torma offering, say for Yamantaka or something, and you yeah. have like a jar yeah. 
like a jar of M&Ms or something. Exactly. You can mentally think I'm offering one each day. So right. this is what okay. I do, right? Is like, I, okay. I have my month's worth of Tormas and I mentally offer one each day. And at the end of the month, I take my jar of 31 or whatever and I give it to okay. someone in prison. So okay. you can do it in that way. Okay. Um, but if it's offered, it's done, right? You've okay. offered it. So if right? it's like a piece of fruit, it should be taken off that day. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have a little, a little change, few changes to make. <laughs> so you don't have to change flowers every day. You just change flowers before they start to wilt. You know, if they've started to wilt, it's a little too late. Like you yeah. only want things on the offer on the altar at their best. Okay. You know? Um, so, and like candles, you can keep lighting the candles again and again, they could, the same candle can be there until the wax is gone because the light is what you're offering and it's continuously present, okay. but the food is kind of a different case. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, at least mentally, um, think it's offered, it's finished. I'm taking it off with permission, not attachment and, you know, do your best. Yes, we remember all of our long rim things about, you know, ethically obtained and, you know, done without deceit and all of the classics, you know, don't steal your neighbor's flowers, that kind of thing. Okay, so it's uh, all like this. So then getting into the actual practice, there are two main visualizations. Um, verses two through six, and this is a strange quirk of Lama Chippa, and it's something that I can discuss with highest yoga tantra practitioners later, but we start with verse two, and we go to verse six, and then we go to verse one and seven and eight, and that little preliminary section, the main visualization is similar to Jorchu practice, which is basically Shakyamuni Buddha in the center, everybody else around him. And if that is a bit much and you are very new to it, don't get yourself overwhelmed. You can think many into one. So Shakyamuni Buddha represents and embodies all of them. The method side, the wisdom side, the extensive conduct, all the protectors, everybody, everybody embodied by Buddha. So you're thinking the Buddha is present and then you're doing those verses. For those without highest yoga tantra, skip anything that says self-generation. Anything that says self-generation or sounds like a self-generation, don't do what that verse says. This section has a self-generation and in verse one, an explicit self-generation. So you skip those parts. And these parts will be done in Tibetan. So if you're just rattling along in Tibetan, not knowing what you're saying, there's not necessarily a fault involved there. It's just that if you're thinking literally that you're doing what it says in the English, that's problematic and will create obstacles. And then you shift and the merit field shifts and the central figure becomes Lama Losong Tuan Dorje Chan, who is basically Lama Tsongkhapa with the Buddha at his heart with Vajadara at his heart, the three concentric beings. And so if this whole merit field is new and overwhelming or unfamiliar, you again can think many into the central figure, the central figure being Lama Lozong, two on Dorje Chen, one in nature with your own root guru. So there's always an option of the elaborate becoming simplified. And even if the simple version seems a bit much, just feel the Guru Buddha is present. So then from this onwards, so from verses nine until 115, and 115 is nearly the end of the practice. This is your main visualization the whole time. There's a section early on where it's described in detail, and then you just kind of like leave it in your mind's eye or leave your sense of it being present and revive it whenever you remember. But the main thing is to feel the whole lineage is here. So at this point, the only thing you have to worry about skipping is the distribution of the Bala and Mandana, the two little bowls that will go around. Don't take those unless you have highest yoga tantra. The other highest yoga tantra elements that are specifically highest yoga tantra elements are probably not obvious enough to worry about. So just follow the chant leader 
and wait until you have highest yoga tantra to read commentaries on the practice. So the whole rest of it, don't worry about what should I skip, what shouldn't I skip, don't worry about it, just don't take the Bala and Madonna. So that little preliminary section, you're really kind of just tuning into your regular refuge, your regular bodhicitta, and then you're elevating it to tantra refuge, tantra bodhicitta. Yeah, so that little beginning section is uh, pretty quick and you might not even be <laughs> grounded and oriented yet. So um, there's a section that actually says the merit field and then it starts developing this more elaborate version here with Lama Lo Sang Tuan Dorje Chan at the center. So in terms of implements, um, you only use implements if you have highest yoga tantra. There's gonna be some sections where there is a lot of music so if you're not used to pujas, just know mentally it's going to get noisy. There might even be cymbals and drums and all sorts of things. For new people, what do you think? What do you think you think? <laughs> when there's all sorts of music going on, what are some thoughts you're supposed to think? Whether you think it's beautiful um, bells and cymbals or you don't think it's beautiful bells and cymbals, what, what do you think you should think about it? But it's an offering. It's an offering. Yep, definitely. It's an offering. It's like also, you know, please pay attention to me, you know, like you really want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's that element it has popped into the messenger emptiness of sound. Yes, yes, that was um, that's the hope. So uh, what makes the sound the out of outside of the bell or the clacker? Where is the sound made exactly? It's dependent arising. So whenever you hear the bell, remember emptiness. Yeah, so of course it's an offering of music, it's an offering of sound, but in terms of a really useful thing to think each time you hear the bell ring is everything that just happened is empty of inherent existence. So it's like you build up these elaborate, beautiful things, and then you remind yourself they are empty of inherent existence, and then you build it back up again and remind yourself that it's empty, and build it back up and remind yourself that it's empty, and do a prostration, and do an offering, and do a confession, and do a rejoicing, and remember that it's empty. It's just keeping you from getting locked. It's keeping you from getting fundamentalist. Almost hear the bell as waking you out of ordinary view. So emptiness, emptiness, emptiness. Why? Because dependently arisen. So then whether you like the sound of the bell or not, it doesn't matter because it can remind you of emptiness. So that's one piece. Um, you can also think of it as a mindfulness spell in case you've vagued out. <laughs> right. But really the main meaning is an offering of sound and remember emptiness. So even if you're not playing those instruments, think that. Um, you can also think that it's calling in all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, particularly the Dakinis from the Ten Directions to the practice. Now, when, you, when you do have a tantric empowerment, it's not like someone's going to suddenly find you in a crowd and say, hey, let me show you how to do all the mudras and show you how to use your Dorje and bell. You're going to have to ask. So um, please use your community use your senior students and, and really ask, where can I learn how to use these things properly and learn their symbolism and their meaning properly. So please do use your communities and um, request the teachings that you need. Okay, so another way to do the merit field, um, this one, this is kind of nice, this is totally optional, is it's simple but a little bit elaborate. So you have Shakyamuni Buddha, you have Lama Lo Sang Tuan Dorje Chan, and then you have method lineage. So in re instead of the whole giant spectrum of the method lineage, you just think Maitreya and Asanga. And then instead of the whole giant spectrum of the wisdom lineage, you can just think Manjushri, Nagarjuna. So if you're a little bit familiar with the merit field, but it's still a lot of characters that you don't know, a lot of historical figures you haven't studied about, but you wanna connect with the essence, the essence is method and wisdom come together with the Guru Buddha. Method and wisdom come together with the Guru Buddha. I like that. Okay. So again, if you're not a great visualizer, just feel that they're present because the essence of Guru Puja is connecting with the Guru. And what is the Guru if not 
all of the Buddhas coming together and to guide you along the path to enlightenment. So whenever you're looking at Tantra practice, there's going to be a lot of ideas of many things merging and then expanding into elaboration and then coming back and merging into something simple and then expanding back into elaboration and that kind of in and out like a breath or a heartbeat a lot of that is to help us overcome ordinary appearance and grasping a main tantric practice but also it's just to feel connection yeah, that the guru is present. The guru has always been present, will always be present. And all of the enlightened beings that have ever come before are communicating with you through your teachers. And if you haven't made a karmic connection with a human teacher yet, it's okay. You can think of someone like His Holiness, the Dalai Lama or Lama Zopa Rinpoche. They exist in real life, flesh and blood, and are a bridge or a gateway to the enlightened mind. So really the essence of this is to feel that teacherness, and it wakes up the inner guru to think in these ways as well. It wakes up your own ability to hear and connect with the path. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'll walk you through a couple of um, sections of the practice. And then so we start here with taking refuge your old friend taking refuge, slightly different form, but beautiful verse. And then you go to this section, which is in Sanskrit. And this has a very nice little simple visualization that when you're reciting the first half, you're purifying mistakes. The second, you're receiving blessings. So sometimes there's a practice of doing this like a mantra where you just go, Namo Guru Bay, Namo Guru Bay, Namo Guru Bay, Namo Guru Bay, purifying. And then Namo Guru Bay, Namo Guru Bay, Namo Guru Bay, receiving blessings. In the puja, when we're doing it not just as a regular practice, but as the whole puja form, we usually just say it three times. And in that case, you can just connect with purifying for a bit and receiving blessings for a bit. The general um, visualization for purification is going to be white, white light. The general visualization for blessings is going to be golden light. So that's a nice thing that you can think that white light is coming from the merit field, purifying your mind. Golden light is coming from the merit field, blessing your mind. And then we have more bodhicitta. And more bodhicitta and more bodhicitta. And then here's the section that is only for those with highest yoga tantra, and I've put it nice blue so you don't have to worry about remembering it. And this verse one that's only for those with highest yoga tantra, you don't have to worry about it, just don't do it. And blessing the offerings, you can't bless them unless you've arisen as the deity. And then the actual practice. So from here on out, just follow along as best as you can, not too tight, not too loose, but that visualization of the merit field then kind of gets elaborately um, conveyed and it's just describing what's there in that picture behind me. So that's quite nice. So we'll do that. And then once it's visualized, we invoke, just like the invocation we were talking about last time. And the wisdom beings and the commitment beings become non-dual. So here at LC17, you think what I have visualized and the Buddhas of all 10 directions have merged together and are very present. And then the seven limbs. So in the seven limbs, what's going to be different is that prostration section is quite long. So instead of thinking I, with body, speech and mind, I prostrate, you think body, speech, and mind, I prostrate to the guru in these various forms. And so for newer folks, I'd really recommend looking at the headings. If you get lost with the Tibetan or lost with the English, keep anchoring yourself with headings because they're really helpful. So you prostrate to the guru as Sambhogakaya, as Nirmanakaya, as Dharmakaya as the manifestation of the three rare sublime ones, meaning Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, as all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and then you make offerings, the second of the seven limbs. Okay, 
So it's going to go like that. And um, just, you know, do the best you can. But if there's parts where you notice you're getting lost, make a note. Yeah, make a note of your lost spots so that we can talk about it tomorrow because um, I want it to feel as connected and engaging as it can. And I, I will do my best to do the tunes as Lama Zopa Rinpoche recommends, but they will be totally imperfect. But that might mean that you're better able to follow them as well, <laughs> because they're more just kind of the simplified, less beautiful version, but might be easier to follow. So we'll just do our best. And um, unless you're gonna annoy the people in your house, do try and do it out loud even if it's just a whisper. There, there's a lot to be said for doing these practices out loud. Okay, so we'll have a, a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and do the practice. <laughs> 